This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today we're joined by Dr. Anthony, who is the principal of his school in beautiful South Florida. If you get to know him or meet him, I feel like you'll be almost instant friends with this guy. He is so easy to talk to. He is passionate about students. He's passionate about his staff and teachers at his school. And we dive into so many things that they're they're up against, as well as things that they're kicking butt at. And it's a blast, as always. So I hope you guys enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater. I'm joined by a new friend of mine, Anthony Turcala, who is the principal of Aventura School of Excellence, City School of Excellence in Aventura, Florida, beautiful Florida. And we're going to dive into all things that he's doing at his school, what's working, what's not. And I think you guys are going to like him. He's a fun personality. He loves football. He's a huge Bucks fan, and you know we just got news obviously in the last week that Tom Brady he's he's retiring. But hey, I love it. He retired and he went out with a bang, in my opinion. I think he did awesome. And uh, but I won't take any more of his uh, thunder. You know, I'm doing great. You know, I appreciate Tom Brady for the years he gave us. Looking forward to great things moving forward. It was a, a fun two years. Introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us about your your school, yourself. What maybe you like to do for fun, and then we'll kind of dive in. My name is Anthony Turcala, proud principal of Aventura City of Excellence School in South Florida, right between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we're a K-8, 1,032 students. This is my 10th year at the school, third year as principal. A wonderful school family. I really believe we're a, a school family. I started as a seventh grade civics teacher, and I've worked every position up, uh, dean, assistant principal, and then now principal. Uh, it's wonderful to be at one place for so long in all of those different roles and still uh, feel like we're making changes and differences in students' lives. You know, I came into education a little bit unique. I went into the Army first and then uh, got a degree in history um, and then continued on to, to become a teacher. And, and now, you know, like I said, proud to be principal of ACES. I love it. Oh, man. So history graduate. Uh, my wife has that too. She's not using the the degree that she got, but she got it. She's like, why did I get a history degree? So I got to ask, do you are you glad you got a history degree or you go mm, I would have got something different if I could go back no I, I think it was the best for me I knew I wanted to teach so so I got the degree uh, to to go into teaching but um really felt like it, it really sharpened my analytical mind and you know I'm not a black and white type of person I like the gray area so it was a fun degree to get okay what's your favorite piece of history you like you know, if you got American history, world history, you got a specific piece of history that you're obviously again being a history graduate, I'm assuming you're a history nerd a little bit. So what's that that thing that really gets you going? No, it was the civil rights movement for me. Uh, mm-hmm. That was that was my favorite part. And specifically, I studied at length uh, the relationship between Lyndon B. Johnson and Martin Luther King. You know, it, it was just an awesome experience for me to really listen in to phone calls and, and read transcripts of conversations. Um, so that whole movement captured my uh, imagination from the beginning and that's what really uh, propelled me through my degree Mm. and I'm sure you are obviously love and are passionate about sharing that with the students that you get to teach that to which I'm guessing as principal you probably don't get to be in the classroom much unless you had a a teacher out I'm assuming right yeah unless we have a teacher out fortunately we've been managing that uh, pretty well but actually I was recently invited to a seventh grade class to share a little bit about uh, my history uh, research Um, they were reading a book related and so, yeah, that was an amazing experience. And I told the teacher, I was, invite me back as much as possible. It's not fitting within my schedule, but the more I force myself to get in there and do it, the better I feel. Uh, it was amazing. I love that. That's awesome. Well, uh, this school that you got going on, let's dive into that school a little bit. Let's see, you guys, you guys into sports? You guys got a ton of things going on in the sports world as a school or not really? We're, we're a smaller school. Like I said, uh, 1,030 uh, K through 8. So nine grades. We're about uh, 115 students per grade level. Uh, we definitely have sports, but our focus is on academics. 
the city of Aventura, we're a charter school, and the city of Aventura holds our charter, and they created the school with a focus on academic excellence. Uh, so we focus on the whole child. We have dance and art and sports and coding and robotics, but our goal is to produce students who are ready to go into high school and honestly start taking college-level classes. So that's a big part of our focus. Uh, so it's a wonderful place to be uh, where parents chose to be at our school and students really buy into that culture and we get to watch them grow for nine years. And so, okay, so this is obviously, you're huge, okay, 1,000 kids, it's a lot. Do you guys anticipate with all the love you guys have and the city support adding on a high school and for additional grades? Yeah, so, so the city actually did and uh, they did it and it's a little bit unique in that our kids don't 100% matriculate to the high school. Uh, the high school needed to be bigger than 100 per grade, so they're 200 per grade. Wow. And so it's a, a new lottery for all citizens of Aventura into Don Sofer Aventura High School, uh, which does have dual diploma option with Cambridge and AP. And um, so our students, you know, if we prepare them right, they're ready to jump right into that, that charter high school and have that you know, college prep experience. Okay, very cool. And these kids that are in middle school, I don't know if this is, I know this is more common in high school, but these kids that are going to the your specific school, do they ever go to yours for schooling, but go somewhere else for sports? Is that something that they're allowed to do or that they do? They're allowed to. Uh, we don't have it uh, happen much. In the high school, we actually, I do know a few students who play uh, football and some of the, the bigger sports uh, at their local high school. Uh, for us, we have a flag football team, a basketball team. We created a track team. And those students, they get to, to get fulfilled in that. And a lot of our students play uh, individual sports outside, uh, club soccer, tennis, golf. So a lot of them will play uh, individual sports that are more club related than um, the traditional schooling experience. Okay. Well, one of the things I asked um, to, to the last person I had on the podcast that I was like, oh, I really want to see what other schools are doing across the country is in terms of fundraising. And I know this is like a, a swing where you're like, oh man, I didn't know about this question, but uh, yeah. I know you, you can roll with the punches. So f in the terms of fundraising, I know there's a lot of schools out there. They they struggle with the with fundraising and oh they're burning out parents because they have to sell these cards or these cookies or popcorn or whatever it is. Is there anything specific you guys do uh, for a fundraiser that is more successful than others that you'd be willing to share mm -hmm. if if there is one that you were like oh this is a really good one we like that maybe could uh, spark the interest of other schools listening? Yeah, no, I'm happy to give a shout out to some of our successful fundraisers. Uh, one was Readathon. Uh, Readathon was um, uh, a program where students get pledges for the minutes that they'll read, and then they, they go on a reading spree. And so their family and relatives and friends of their family uh, donate money to the school based on how many minutes the students read. Obviously, that brings in that literacy component. Uh, so it's a win-win. And um, the overhead is very low, so we actually keep a, a large percentage of the, the funds raised. So that was a great one. You know, we actually had a teacher recently bring up a fundraising idea we're, we're working out and getting ready to do is group pictures. And, and I remember when she mentioned it, I remember doing it when I was in school and kind of forgot about it. So the students will be able to dress up and we'll call them with their friend group that they're going to take pictures. And instead of using a company, uh, we're using parents to take the pictures and we're giving them the digital image. So that'll be another fundraiser uh, as well. Okay. I like those. All right. Thank you for sharing. So with your school and every school, again, across the country, there's obviously, no matter what, there's probably going to be some struggles or some challenges that you guys are specifically up against. And I typically ask it to everybody, if you were to put it into three, it doesn't have to be, it could be one or, you know, two. What are some of those challenges that you guys are facing specifically as a school? I think they're very similar, you know, across as I read uh, magazines and articles and blogs. So first, for me, decision making and crisis fatigue, it's nonstop, right? And, and it's, you know, left and right, all of these different things. And there's no blueprint or roadmap. So even any level of experience wouldn't really help us in that, in that case. Um, and, and I see it extending down to the teacher level as well. So, you know, it's just the unknown is difficult when the unknown extends for this long it can become even more difficult. So um, I think that's, that's a big challenge that we're all facing. Reminding ourselves, you know, we have to focus on those important things, you know, trauma-related incidents, student mental health, but not everything that pops in our inbox is an emergency, right? And it's, it's kind of hard to remember that in the moment. Um, so just taking that step back. So that's definitely one. I don't know if you want to talk about that or get into to some other ones. Um, yeah, I mean, going off of that one, so... 
I feel like obviously, you know, the elephant in the room, as everybody will say, last two years, COVID, you know, it's like, okay, it's exhausting. I think I'm sure teachers, again, from talking to more people with the podcast is it's obviously not just one state dealing with it, of course. So it's all these people and teachers, I think are exhausted. And I feel like, and I don't know if this would relate to this part that you're, you're sharing is just, they're exhausted from the stress of what people expect of them, I think, too. I think it's already been heightened, of course, just being a teacher uh, in general. And now I have a like I have a two-year-old, and we just, just put him in preschool. And just like going like, and I'm not like mean or anything, but I'm always like, I want to know what he's learning. What is he doing? Like, I want to be involved in his education. So now you put it on the next level up, and we're talking about all the stuff with what's going on in our country and COVID and everything. I think it just... That's a lot of pressure to ask of somebody who's already probably not getting paid uh, even what they should be paying to begin with. Like, do you feel like that's just making that way, way worse, that first one you shared about? A hundred percent. You know, I, it's funny. I've had, I have a great relationship with our parents. You know, I've taught many of their older kids and or cousins. So I can be, you know, pretty honest and open. And sometimes I'll tell them, you know, it's not realistic to expect the teacher to respond that quickly to this question. And this question is not an emergency, right? We can fix grades after the fact, you know, there, there are things we can handle later. And, you know, it's not, it's really not fair, you know, and even, you know, money out of the equation. I went to a Starbucks the other day and there was a sign on the door saying, we don't have enough staff, go to the drive through And I'm just thinking, you know, if Starbucks is in a position where this is what's occurring, you know, where is the grace for the teachers uh, and for the schools when all of these things are being dealt with, um, you know, we see, we see our, our store shelf, our store shelves aren't full, right? Some of the items we're used to purchasing aren't even available. Uh, car lots don't have cars. So I, I do feel like that grace didn't get extended to the school level yet. So I, I've kind of gotten up front and, and told teachers, you know, let's recalibrate. We don't have to respond to every email immediately. Sometimes we just acknowledge receiving it. Uh, we get the facts later and, and deal with it because we can't be on 24-7 is not sustainable. Yeah, especially when you're there in front of the kids. I'm sure being in front of the students is more important than responding to an email, unless of course it was a life or death situation, but that's their job is to teach and educate the students. So man, uh, go, okay, so keep going. Number two, what, what you got? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one that leads right into that is just the teacher's workload and managing it. Um, you know, it was already difficult before. Um, when you add on to it, the unknown of COVID, students quarantining, uh, meaning that that's a missed work that has to be made up. And they're at our school, they're joining online in that case. You know, that's a lot by itself. And then when you add the discourse in the news, uh, whether someone agrees or disagrees with what's happening, you know, the profession is constantly in the news, uh, whether it's uh, critical race theory or school boards and mass mandates or any number of things. It's just a lot. So the teacher's workload in general, uh, managing that is difficult. And uh, we have to acknowledge a lot has been added and it's not just, you know, paying more or giving stipends. You know, those are great and they have to happen. Uh, but at some point we need to look and think, you know, how many minutes a day are we giving teachers to do these administrative tasks? You know, we're not even talking about lesson planning and grading papers and evaluating data and uh, responding to that data to fill gaps. You know, all of that takes time and it's not really built into their schedule. Um, I haven't heard much talk about systemic changes to that, you know, and it would bring funding. It would require funding and space and, and a lot of different things. But I think teachers' workloads uh, are unknown. I don't think many in the public really understand uh, the expectations we place on them. And they gladly do it because they want to help kids. But we see the impacts of that and, and many are choosing a different profession, sadly, uh, and I think there's nothing sadder than, than seeing that because people who get into education just wanted to help kids. And if they're choosing to leave, we have to look at why. So I hope we can have a broader discussion about that and figure out how do we fix that mm -hmm. issue and make their workload reasonable. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's one reason, one of the reasons behind this podcast is I wanted to, there's obviously school leaders all across the country that have something they're doing right that they can help. Hopefully my goal is it inspires mm -hmm. others, other people who are listening going, I've never thought about doing that before. And maybe I should do that. And the one I gave just to the um, person I, the last person I interviewed was the school we have my, my son in. I wanted to, um, I shared this on the last episode. So anybody's listening, you're like, oh, I heard this story, but it's, I like, I want to mention it because I went to the, the, the teachers and I was like, Hey, what's your favorite coffee? And they're like, Oh, uh, you know, I like Dunkin', the other one likes Starbucks. And I was like, okay. 
And so the she goes, well, if, you know, if you really want to, you know, check it out, there's a thing on the website that you would have access to as the parent, um, where it shares. Mm-hmm. It's a Google Doc that a Google form that all the teachers filled out when they start showing what their favorite candy, what's their favorite coffee, what's their favorite whatever. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went there and I looked across and saw what's their favorite movie, what's their, all these different things. And I saw like one of them liked a certain coffee from Dunkin' and whatever. And so I bought them, I bought them all coffee when I dropped them off at school the other day. And you can just see in their face, like, they're like, wow, like, thank you so much. And you could like, it's $3, you know, or five, whatever it ends up being for that coffee. But just showing like, hey, me as a parent, I see you, I care about you and I'm thankful for you and you pouring into my, my son and, uh, and I, I hope more people will do that. And so like I, last episode, I said the same thing. Any leaders who are listening, like, I know it doesn't go very far, but I'm thankful for you and what you're doing and raising up this next generation. That's a tall order to ask of somebody. And I want you to be encouraged and not, not down on yourself every day because you are making a difference whether you see it yet or not. Yeah, no, 100%. It, it, and it doesn't take much. Um, you know, those small gestures it helps make the grind more worth it absolutely um because the bad news comes quickly the sad news comes quickly so sometimes those those moments of gratitude uh are few and far between but when they come it definitely makes a big difference that's beautiful well we talk about the uh the lows the challenges obviously there's got to be some wins and things you guys are kicking butt at of course that are just going really smoothly so what if you would again if you got three, awesome. Share what the, the wins are for you. Yeah, I mean, so starting there with what I just discussed, we have been successful in creating some boundaries. And we've, we've been, my word is explicit, right? I, I like to say we need to be explicit because uh, sometimes in communication, we're asking people to read between the lines and, and we're not very clear in what we're saying. Um, so, so we have to be clear. And, and so I've been clear to the parents and said, you know, do not expect teachers to respond in less than 24 hours consistently. And sometimes it might not even be less than 48 hours. And you just have to assume good intentions and assume they just had a a heavy workload and weren't able to. And if you need to reach out to an administrator, that's not negative, that's not a negative thing, but uh, setting those boundaries and and really getting out in front of the teachers and saying, I'm gonna be this barrier where I can. Um, The same with behavior. Um, You know, we've witnessed, you know, student behavior decline over the past year. It's not where we're used to seeing it. So trying to be as supportive as possible while also being um, developmentally responsible in our consequences and and how we have these conversations with students. So I think that's a win for us. We're not going to arrive at a destination there. We're not going to say, oh, we solved the boundary problem or the discipline problem. But I feel good about our ability to get out in front of that and, and really be the voice to say, hey, if you need to take that break, we said it's okay. Uh, let the parents come talk to us. And, and if we need to adjust, let it come through us. Um, so I definitely feel like that's a win. We have not had the issue on subs, like I mentioned before. And partly because, you know, I don't honestly, I don't think the federal government gets enough credit for the amount of funding they've put into COVID. Funding's definitely not the issue, I think, right now. It's a short-term patch. Nobody can build long-term plans off of these funds that expire in a few years. But one, one thing we did is we hired uh, four substitutes at the beginning of the year and told them, you're coming every day. And, and we ended up, we called them teachers in training. The goal is to help them get certified so that hopefully next year or the year after, they're actually teachers with us. But in the short term, uh, they're there every single day and the assignments come. It's very rare they don't have an assignment, unfortunately. Uh, but when they don't, they're able to go observe classes uh, give coverage breaks to teachers so they can grade papers and respond to communication. I feel really comfortable with what we did with subs. We never once had to collapse classes and, and send kids to a different teacher. Administration has covered a few periods, but not for the day, uh, the way I, I know some of my peers have, have had to do. Uh, so we've been very fortunate on that front uh, that, that our plan worked out and, and it really um, helped. You know, Outside of the, the surge after winter break when we had to use our interventionists and coaches to cover some classes, uh, those professionals have been able to do what they signed up to do, coach teachers uh, and give interventions. So that, that's been a big win for us, uh, absolutely. And that is a huge win because the more school leaders I've talked to is they can't get enough teachers or they're having a hard time with the subs, just like you mentioned. That is a hard one that they've they've done. And I'm, I'm assuming 
uh, every school. I don't know if that you tell me if this is by state or by county or by the school. Do you guys get to set the standard of what people have to have to be able to be a sub? Can they just have a diploma or do they have to? Where is that those those rules come from? That's typically either a state or a district responsibility to set those standards. For me in a charter school network, we have it, but they're pretty similar across the board uh, in terms of the degrees. And many of them have kind of shifted those expectations as the need grew. But for these subs that I was able to hire, they, they, were, they qualified to be daily subs. The difference is, is typically they would be on call. And I think part of the reason for the sub um, crisis is because there are jobs everywhere. So if you're getting a sub pay to be on call to possibly work, you probably can go somewhere and get an actual job. And subbing isn't the most uh, beautiful job to have right now. Again, thinking about student behavior, COVID, expectations, responsibilities, it's, it's a hard job to have right now. So um, outside of the benefit of the coverage, the benefit was is these people had our school logins. They had our school credentials. They were on our emails. They got our newsletters and attended our staff meetings. They were had access to all of our professional development. So some of those very difficult things about walking into the classroom and trying to get it started without asking you know, an 11-year-old for help, that starts the day off you know, pretty difficult by itself. So our subs already had that. So if the budget and the, um, the personnel were there, I think every school has the ability to do this. And again, the, the big, bigger thing is if it works, we're building our pipeline. And we're determining are these substitutes able to become teachers and they can take advantage of our training. So it's a win-win uh, for both us and the substitutes. Well, sounds like whatever you're doing, it's working. You got people, you got plenty of help. You're not having to be in the classroom every day teaching, which uh, I'm sure you would obviously love, but you have other things you got to be focusing on too, of course. So as we kind of prepare to close it out and we can still obviously chat too, I'd love to just give you an opportunity to share uh, any kind of final thought or inspiration or encouragement you have for any school leaders listening that you would be like, man, this is what I wish I knew when I first started, or this is what I'd want to tell them right now with what we're going through that um, they might want to hear. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot there. I would say thinking about what I wish I knew when I first started, and I'm still um, newer, you know, I'm in my third year and you have a two year old, I have a three year old. So I had a daughter right around the time I, I became principal. Um, and then COVID of course, in the middle of it. So you know, I've been learning along with everyone else, have a lot to learn. But one thing that I've shifted is my uh, long-term planning. You know, I, I really uh, make time to think six months, one year, one and a half years, two years into the future and what I hope to achieve and let that guide my current decision making. And also my teams, really solidifying the roles and responsibility, res responsibilities of everyone on the team making sure it's understood the chain of command. And education's a little different. Like I was in the army, like I said, and chain of command was simple. There was a vertical line. You just went from one person to the other, but there's like interconnected circles in education. It depends on, you know, the time of day. Is it before school, after school? Uh, different responsibilities, different people will have. But the more clear we can make that chain of command and the roles of respons and responsibilities, the more success we're gonna see. Because now those leaders are set up to expand their influence. And I feel the more I'm a principal, the more I realize the goal is to make me less and less relevant and to make everybody else more and more relevant. And, and if I'm doing that every day, then I know um, I'm getting closer to success uh, because I can only do so much. There's 115 other people who can go out and expand their influence. So that's always my goal. Let me help them do that. And I love that you mentioned the part about setting your goals and kind of you know, going thinking long term. Is that something that you are also having your teachers do or wanting to maybe transition into like this year going, hey, I want you to be planning out this next two years of where you want to be. And maybe that's I mean, obviously that's going to look different for every subject matter, every teacher. But is that something you're wanting to kind of start with teachers? With teachers, uh, like I said, their plate's pretty full. I, I write every Monday, a uh, Mindset Monday uh, to our, our school staff. And I, I share a public version of that. And in my Mindset Monday, because I believe mindset is everything and it shapes everything that we do, there is where I try to get them to think, um, what is my mindset around this? What is my philosophy? What is my why behind what I'm doing? And in that sense, I'm hoping they're thinking long term, right? Where am I going so I know the, the route I need to take? Of course, lesson planning, we, we talk about backwards design. 
um, and all of those elements. With our leaders, I really um, have more and more uh, pushed a strategic planning mindset and um, we have monthly strategic planning meetings. We revisit our goals, we state our goals and, uh, and it's just, the whole goal is an open and honest conversation. If it's on the paper, are we doing it? If we're not doing it, do we take it off the paper or are we failing in some capacity? And that's, that's really, you know, always been my, my mindset around that is, is let's plan based on reality. You know, we don't need to have these pretty documents and charts. What are we actually doing? And, um, and I feel good about doing that with our leadership team constantly um, so that they can, they can, again, have that influence they should have. And I, I love that specifically because I'm doing that with a friend of mine uh, where I told him, him and I were having kind of like a heart to heart, like being honest. And I was like, man, I feel like I get to the end of the week and I didn't get all the things done that I wanted to, or I just, it was a blur. And all I feel like was I put out fires all week or whatever. And so we, him and I have been accountability partners with getting stuff done, which I think is the biggest piece. I think if you're trying to just do it all by yourself, that's kind of almost setting yourself up for failure. It's hard. It's just super hard. So him and I will, um, we, we talk every Monday, we call it vision Monday where we talk, Hey, here are the things, three things we do specifically three things we want to get done this week. And then we recap on Friday at the end of the week going, all right, how, how did you do? And why did you not complete it? If you didn't complete it type of thing. And, and it's awesome because this before the year started, we did plan out what are the three things I want to complete for 2022, the whole year. And then you work it backwards, the three things for quarter one and three things for January. And I was like, when you look at this huge thing you want to complete for the year, but then you look at it and going, okay, there's just little steps every day to get me to the top. Like it's, it's, it's a little more refreshing, I guess, to get there. So when you mentioned it, I was like, I love that because I see the, what you're trying to do. That's awesome. Yeah, it's motivating. It's, it's hard to keep going, you know, when you only see that big, big goal at the end. Uh, but everyone can achieve something small. Uh, so the more we could break big tasks into small tasks is definitely more attainable. I totally agree. Well, I wanted to give you a big thank you. I meant to mention it earlier. Thank you for your service to our country. Um, I'm super thankful for that. And I'm also obviously thankful for you uh, being a leader of students. So thank you for pouring into that next generation to help them be uh, better pieces of society is obviously what we're shooting for. So thank you very much and for taking time to be on the podcast today. Wish you guys nothing but the best. So thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, sir. It was awesome. I appreciate you. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Anthony for taking time and being on the podcast today. I loved chatting with him because you can just feel the love that he has for his students and the teachers and the staff that are under him at his school. And I just, I love that. You can feel it. And I know he's doing amazing things there and he's going to continue to do amazing things there as the years go on. So again, thank you, Anthony, for being on the podcast. As always, I hope you guys took at least one thing from today, from hearing Anthony talk, that you can take back to your school to better the, the students' environment, their lives, the teachers' lives, their work environment, Whatever it is, I hope you can take one thing back to make your school better than it is right now. You can get in touch with us if you have any questions at schoolsuccessmakers.com. We would love to hear from you. And as always, we'll be here next week with another awesome guest on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.